Hello there. Welcome to another podcast from Bible Based Podcasts with me, Ron Bailey from BibleBased.com. And you've joined us at study number five in our Bible Based Advent calendar, where we will be doing a countdown to Christmas and a few days beyond with brief Bible studies giving the background and the context of the Christmas story. 15 minutes or so. You ought to be able to find these studies in all kinds of places. At Bible Based Podcasts, at BibleBased.com, at the Friends of Bible Based Face group, Facebook group, as a Bible Based blog post, and especially where they'll be broadcast at NewLifeRadio.co.uk with Mike Coles. And, so I'm told, on Spotify. So, study number five. The promise of a son to the Gentiles. In the previous four, we've been focusing on the promise of a seed to Eve and to Abraham and to Judah and to David. There's a promise here of a son to the Gentiles. I'm going to read from Psalm 2, verses 7 to 8. I will tell of the decree. Jehovah said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance. That's from the American Standard Version of 1901, which is my favourite Old Testament version. If you're more familiar with the Old King James Version, you'll have a different world here, where the American Standard Version has nations. The Old King James Version has the word heathen. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. It's the word often translated Gentiles, in modern Bibles. We've seen how God had promised a seed for his own people. Now he promises a son for the nations outside the context of the Sinai covenant. I will give you the Gentiles for your inheritance. Now, if you remember, the great thing that happened at Sinai is that Israel became God's inheritance. Oh, yes, I know he promised them an inheritance but he became theirs and they became him. This picture of the son asking f the father for the nations for his inheritance is a picture that has a kind of... Well, let me read, just let me read to you from Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 to 10. You know that the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. And here we shall find the believing children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, both Jew and Gentile, although those distinctions are now redundant. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephthalim <laughs> were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God 
who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So what is this promise of a son to the nations? Well, there are several passages of Scripture we could have used for this podcast. But I've opted for this wonderful psalm. This psalm was first opened up for me by an old man in his 90s who lived in a little fisherman's cottage in Wells next to sea in Norfolk. I was just a teenager. He declared it as a heavenly conversation within the triune Godhead, and he divided it into three parts. In the first part, after the introduction, the Father speaks. That's from verse 1 to verse 6. Then the Son speaks, from Psalm 2, and verse 7 to 9, and then we find the Holy Spirit is speaking. Those familiar with the Newbury Bible will know where he derived his divisions. The psalm was almost certainly composed for David, but its themes are far greater than can have application to David only. The opening scene. The historical setting is probably unrest in David's expanding kingdom, but seen from heaven's perspective, that unrest is a picture of an abiding spiritual condition on earth. Psalm 2, verse 1, Why do the nations, Gentiles, rage, and the peoples meditate a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against Jehovah and against his Christ, saying, Let us break their bonds asunder and cast away their cords from us. The familiar distinction that is the backdrop of the Old Testament scripture, appears here again. The Hebrew word translated nations is linked with guim, the word that's frequently translated as Gentiles. The psalm has a clear divide, God and his people, and those who are not God's people. The speaker discerns a united conspiracy against Jehovah and his Christ, Messiah. Yes, that is the word Messiah, the anointed one. In the historical setting, it's David and Jehovah as God's divinely authorized agent on earth. In the largest setting, it is the Messiah, Christ. The speaker recognizes that the tumult of the nations is, at its base, a rebellion against God and his delegated authority. It may seem from an earthly perspective that this is a legitimate uprising against a foreign master, but the speaker discerns that the uprising is really against Jehovah and against his anointed one, his Christ. This is a spiritual rebellion. The Gentiles, those outside the Sinai covenant, are united in a conspiracy and rebellion against God and against his will. Their purpose is to overthrow God's order to break free of his constraints, to break the chains and throw off the ropes, to be free of God and his interferences. The distinction between the Sinai covenant, people of God, and the nations is highlighted in a well-known but perhaps often misunderstood verse of scriptures from the Proverbs. This is Proverbs 29 verse 18, where there is no vision, the King James says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. If we consider the verse in its context, we shall find that a more accurate sense is carried in more modern translations, which render the verse along the lines of, where there is no revelation, the people perish, but happy is he who keeps the law. The distinctive of the Sinai covenant people was that to them, the oracles of God had been entrusted. Their faith was based on revelation. It was, in that sense, Bible-based. Blood was sprinkled on the altar, on the book, and on the people. Their faith was based on revelation, not speculation. And that revelation was contained in laws and ordinances. It's contrasting the people who are without the revelation of God and his will with those who have submitted to his authority. The children of Israel had submitted to his will at Sinai and had become his people. 
those outside the Sinai covenant were the Gentiles, or as they were labeled later by the Jews, sinners of the Gentiles. The New Testament has its own language for this distinction. This is John's first epistle, chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And, of course, John's Gospel itself in chapter 15, verse 19, If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Perhaps that seems a harsh tone for the Apostle of Love or for an Advent series, but it's a continuing reality that there are two people groups in our world. Those who have become God's people, those who are His, and those who have not surrendered to Him yet. Remember, however, that this is not the last word. We need to get to the end of the psalm to see the solution to our danger. Heaven's response to earth's tumult. Psalm 2, verse 4 to 6. What's God's response to that scene of the conspiracy, the nations locked together to defy God and his Christ? It's here. Psalm 2, verse 4. He that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. Then will he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. God's derisory laughter is the response to the feeble protests of human rebellion. As someone has remarked, as God views the united conspiracies of the creation, he is not nervous. He continues to reign from heaven's throne. The rebellion will be judged and the rebels brought to justice. God's will is not to be thwarted. He has set his king in the place of authority and power. The word translated set is a word associating with an outpouring or an anointing. We may legitimately translate it, yet I have Christed my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And the pronoun I is emphasized in the Hebrew. In contrast to what the rebellious conspiracies are doing, I have done this. I have anointed my king. The continuing rebellion is futile. God has placed his Christed one, his Christ, on the throne. You remember Jesus' words at the end of Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me, in heaven and in earth. So the people having conspired, and God having laughed derisively, now the Son speaks. I will tell of the decree. Jehovah said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Paul quoted this psalm in the course of his preaching in the synagogue in Antioch in Pisidia in Acts chapter 13. The passage there and in other parts of the Acts of the Apostles show how the early Christians regarded this messianic psalm. They saw it not only as a statement of God's endorsement of David, but also as a promise of the one of whom David was a prophetic type, not merely an anointed one, but the anointed one, the promised Messiah. This is Acts chapter 13, verse 32. And we declare to you good tidings. That promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you 
the sure mercies, that's the covenant faithfulness promised to David. Acts 13, verse 32 to 34. The promise of the anointed one and the guarantee of the covenant faithfulness of God had fulfilled the promise of this ancient psalm. God had set his king upon his holy hill, or as we might interpret it, God had enthroned the Son as his appointee to rule over all. Now, Christ's testimony. The certainty of this image is strengthened in Psalm 2 by a personal testimony from the anointed Son. I will tell of the decree. Jehovah said to me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Having fulfilled his Father's will, Christ ascends to the highest throne. All authority in heaven and earth is his. He can use it in a fierce retribution against those who have striven against him, but he has given a promise. Ask, and I will give. He has promised the nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles, as his inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. Ultimately, he will judge the world and its peoples, and those who have persisted in their rebellion will experience his wrath. But wait, there's more. Now we come on to the spirits speaking. Now therefore, be wise, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve Jehovah with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish in the way, for his wrath will soon be kindled. Blessed are all they that take refuge in him. Here is an invitation to the rebels. His wrath is not inevitable. There is an amnesty, and the rebels are invited to be wise. There's an old chorus, isn't there? He maketh the rebel a priest and a king. In spite of all our resistance and rebellion, we may still come and surrender. We may turn from our rebellion and yield to God to be those who serve him. We are admonished to kiss the son. This is not an amorous or a romantic kiss, or even the kiss of a friend. This is the kiss of the monarch's hand in public acknowledgement of allegiance to a master. This is the kiss of surrender. But we must come while we may. The danger continues while we tarry. And the psalm that began with rebellion and the threat of a withering judgment ends with a blessing. Those outside the covenant are guaranteed accepting and blessing if they will only turn and live. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And throughout the world, irrespective of nation or culture or language, the Spirit still speaks the same truth. Hebrews 3, verse 15, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Or as the angel said on that great day, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people the promise of a son for the Gentiles. Come and join me again tomorrow for the next step in our journey. God bless you.